finding buddies that new hire can lean on who's outside of the people function. And of course, it, I think our biggest role in that is just making sure operationally everything works yeah. and that the day is delightful and smooth and easy. Somebody yeah. would show up and, and be like, hey, I'm here. They'd find somebody they knew and grab a desk and yeah. off they went. Um, that doesn't scale. I'm a big believer in speed and iterating. Yeah. I think there is a quality bar things must pass and it's probably yeah. at like 70 or 80 percent and then push it out and iterate as you go. It takes a long time to build trust and it takes yeah. very little time to destroy trust. It's been a wild ride, a really fun and rewarding and wild ride. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Leaders in Talent podcast. My name is Adrian Kolf, and I'm your host. And every two weeks, I interview leaders in talent that are making their mark on our industry. And today, I have the honor to welcome Annie Wigman. Annie's career started working at Google, where she worked with Laszlo Bock, who at the times was the senior VP of operations at Google. After Google, Annie worked at Etsy and Gusto in people operations roles, only to leave Gusto to work once more with Laszlo as his CPO and basically C of everything at Laszlo's startup. Most recently, Annie built out the people partner function at Forerunners Venture Capital and has now recently made the transition back into in-house as the head of people at a company called Character.ai, which is a very rapidly growing AI startup. Annie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. So Annie, funny story that only we know, but our listeners don't know. You had to reschedule our podcast multiple times. And I do know why, because things are really hectic and almost like pretty crazy at Character AI. Am I correct to say that? Yes, it's been a wild ride. A really fun and rewarding and wild ride. <laughs> Tell me a little bit more. What do you do with Character AI and what's happening and what are you in the midst of? Yeah, well, I'm the head of people here. I was hired in April. And in late July, early August, we went through a transaction with Google where they licensed some of our, a non-exclusive license of some of our technology and took some of our pre-training researchers. And so now we are in this moment of rebuilding as a product company, whereas before we had two somewhat conflict or competing missions, one to get to AGI and one to build a consumer product company. And yep. now we're able to really focus on the latter, but it's been immensely fulfilling challenge to try to navigate the people parts that come along with that of like how to build this new company, how to get people energized about it, how to, you know, show people the potential here. And then obviously like all the operational things that come along with it as well, where we, we have a cleared cap table. Yeah. What do we do with that? And everybody's now fully owners in the company and, and what should that look like? So it's been great. Are you facing market volatility? Need to hire quickly or have a team that sits idle? Meet Matcher, your flexible recruitment and sourcing partner. Scale your recruitment capacity up or down without compromising on quality. Trusted by Booking.com, Miro, Heineken, Grammarly, and Deal. Matcher is the RPO disruptor, making waves in Europe and the US. For scale-ups and corporates, Matcher covers engineering, go-to-market, and GNA roles. Visit matcher.io to see how we can support you. That's M-A-T-C-H-R dot I-O. So, so I need help, help me understand it a little bit better, right? So Google bought your company or Google became shareholder of, of, of the company? Like what, or am I missing something here? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna toe the line carefully because I don't know how much I'm allowed. Yeah, to yeah share. no, of course, of course. Share, the, share whatever you 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 want to share. Yeah. Yeah, in the media, it's the public information that I know is that they paid us a large sum of money to basically hire a, a handful of our top researchers, including our founders, and license some of our technology. That is used as an investment and to pay yeah. out employees to a degree and so on and so forth. But that means we're now just a standalone company that's wholly employee owned. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. So, and you said you were working on two different projects. It's probably also like your message to the people that you hired. And now because of the transaction, the company has pivoted or, or focused on, on one single product. Yeah. I wouldn't call it a pivot. I think it's just where, I think it's allowed us to drive a deeper focus into yeah. building a consumer AI product, which is great. It's really exciting. And of course that that takes some bringing people along. Like there's been 
we're only six weeks post six, seven weeks post deal. So people take a long time to, to process change and understand it. And so I think there's a number of people who are like, great, this is awesome. Let's go. Yeah. Then there's a number of people who are, are still processing and, and trying to understand what is the mission moving forward and how do we get on. And the energy is really exciting. Like yeah, people yeah, are excited. Yeah. And it's very much a startup where we have, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Tell me a little bit more what all of this has meant in the last five to six months that you've been with the company in terms from a people perspective. Like when you yeah. came in, what did the situation look like? And with everything that's had happened, where are you now? From a people perspective, I'd say it's been a lot of pivots because yeah. of it. It's been, it came in, was building out the team, building out some of the like core foundations, as you would when you join a fast growing startup in a people leadership role, thinking about what feedback should look like, performance management, like, do we have the right tools and systems? Are we on the right payroll provider? So on and so forth. And then this happened and it was like, well, now we need to figure out the cap table. We need to figure yeah. out how to retain people and yeah. how do we pay people? And is this, how do we hire again? And what's our new mission and, and all that. So it's been, it's truly been a journey of like, of change is the only constant within a startup. Yeah. Um, but I think we're now at a place where we're back to ready to create some of the like, how do we do feedback and how should we do performance management? while also thinking deeply about how do we retain our employees and continue to get people motivated and excited to be part of a, a product company. I definitely want to zoom in a little bit more on, on how you retain people because the AI space is just absolutely wild what's happening right now and the salaries that are offered left and right. But you coming into the company, right? Knowing like the rocket ship that, that you're on, like into, how many employees were there when you joined and like what was the, what is like the hiring, what was the hiring velocity that, that, that was happening at the time? Yeah, that's an interesting part. So I probably, I don't know, I might've been like employee 90 or something. And we were adding like six or seven people a week for a little while there. Oh, wow. Uh, at the time of the deal, we were, I think just north of 130. Yeah. And we're now ab about a hundred. So we're still, and we're growing, we're still yeah. adding people now and just being really deliberate about the types of profiles we need and who we want in order to, again, build a, a successful product company. Yeah. yeah, so it's there was a big focus on onboarding, and we were spending a lot of time thinking about how to set people up for success, and which is obviously still important. Yeah. It was way more of a like P zero, I think, when we had seven or eight people starting every week, and now we've had a little bit of time to sit and 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 wait to figure out how to rebuild that muscle. How do you go about that particular part in terms of doing that well with? everyone working overtime already just to get their job done, but then also having to interview, having to hire and bringing in people up to speed. What was the process that, 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 that you followed? And while also like building up your own team and capabilities. Yeah, I, I think it, it's about figuring out the right people to tap and to utilize people across the company and their strengths. So I think particularly in the people function, we always need to be thinking about who else should we be working with to make our processes better, to make them land better, to make sure people have the right information. So we work a lot with our engineers to figure yep. out like, do, you know, does this process seem right? Like, are these the values that sound right to you? Like, how should we workshop these? And we don't, we haven't been doing many of our work streams in a vacuum. And so I think with, with onboarding people successfully, it's about figuring out like, who are the people to do onboarding sessions so that people know about like the engineering organization, the product organization. It's about finding buddies that new hire can lean on who's outside of the people function. And of course, it, I think our biggest role in that is just making sure operationally everything works yeah. and that the day is delightful and smooth and easy and people aren't eating lunch alone. They have a a, a desk to sit at yeah. and their yeah. IT is set up. Yeah. That's yeah. how we think about it. Hey, and was there anything in place or did you basically build this from the ground up or like revamp this, the whole onboarding process? Yeah, we really built it from the ground up. I believe that before we had a, a people team, it was people would show up and this was when we were very small. So it worked. Yeah. Somebody yeah. would show up and, and be like, Hey, I'm here. They'd find somebody they knew and grab a desk and yeah. off they went. Um, that doesn't scale as when it can be quite overwhelming if you walk into a, a company of 70, 80 people and you're like, where do I go? <laughs> so we, we've got yeah. a little bit of structure around it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and how, because I, 
we also like, we work for many rapidly scaling companies and it's always like hard to like quality versus speed. And especially because you're in such a competitive, super rapidly growing industry. What's your take there in terms of doing that from an overall people perspective? I'm a big believer in speed and iterating. Yeah. I think there is a quality bar things must pass and it's probably yeah. at like 70 or 80% and then push it out and iterate as you go. I think we don't ever want to put something out that makes us look bad or that is not, that we're not sure is, is a good enough effort in the thing, it, whatever it is. So onboarding or I don't know, our, our payroll process or like whatever it has to actually payroll process is a really bad example that yeah. needs to be at like 99% um, yeah. perfect. Yeah, but yeah, I think yeah. a lot of what we do, it, it, it can constantly be iterated. Yeah, the exception would obviously be payroll, taxes, benefits. All that has to be perfect. You're in the space. You're competing against Meta, OpenAI, Amazon, Google. Google basically hired but 30, 30 right. of your top top researchers in terms of how competitive this, this space is. How do you deal with that? And how do you even compete with these companies? Do you even compete with these companies at all? Like what's, yeah, what's your take there? Yeah, we do. I think the benefit of being a startup is that you go to Google and Facebook, like people leave those companies because they can't get anything done yeah. and, it, and they're frustrating and they're bureaucratic. And it's, and so people get excited to roll up their sleeves and like actually have impact at a startup. Yeah. And so I think it's really leaning into that and making sure that magic stays. And that, so that's like figuring out ways to really help people find meaning in their work and make sure we have the, the right processes set up so that we can help them find that meaning. And particularly for the younger generations, I think they really thrive when they feel like they're working on something bigger and they understand how the work that they're doing connects to the mission. And so I think it's like having a clearly defined goal and mission as a company and a vision. And that's something we're working hard on right now is to make sure that we have that so we can tie people's work back to it. Cause I think that's incredibly important for retention. I think building trust so that people know that they can trust their leadership, they can trust their managers. Um, I think that's a really key part of retention. I think you see a lot of employees leave. People start to leak to the media when they don't trust their company. And then empowerment. So giving people the keys to go do stuff. Yeah, They don't get that at big companies often. So really putting people in positions where they can learn quickly and grow and feel that they own their own work. I think those are some of the, the key ways we can compete. We can compete from a like potential earning perspective if yeah. we appropriately like award equity and sell the dream of the equity. Yeah. On the cash side, we can get close. We can, but we can't compete with Google's cash comp or, yeah. or Facebook's cash comp. And that's yeah. just not the play, I don't think. I think the play is really in, in our unique differentiator as a startup. Yeah. When you say, because I find this a very interesting topic, like when you say build trust, right? Yeah. How do you do that from a leadership perspective? And also, especially from that spider in the web people perspective. It is really hard. It takes a long time to build trust and it takes yeah. very little time to destroy trust. Yeah. So I think particularly post-transaction, we're still in this moment of like needing to I wouldn't even say rebuild trust. I think it's just build trust because yeah. we're new. I'm new to the company. We have a new interim CEO who's phenomenal and like has couldn't be a better person to be at the helm and, and working to build this trust. But I think it just takes time. I think it's like being open, no question off limits. If people feel that they can come talk to us and ask us any questions and we're going to do our best to answer it, yeah. that really helps. I think presence. So if you're not just a, a floating head somewhere, if you actually sit down and eat meals with your employees and like get to know them. And I think knowing people as people is really helpful for trust building. And then on the flip side, just really watching yourself, watching the decisions we make in order to make sure we don't start to destroy or erode that trust, like quick, fast decisions about things that really impact people can immediately destroy their trust. If it's like something as silly as like ripping a benefit away without yeah. a clear explanation of why you're doing that it can overnight just make people anxious and frustrated and not trust you. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Is, are there any way that you do that proactively or like that you've 
build a process around that level of communication or that checking in? It's just being super thoughtful as a team about everything we're trying to do. And it's hard because we're moving fast and like some of the stuff that some of the, the benefits we've had to date as picking back on this example, don't make sense to keep scaling as a company. So it's just having the conversations about what does this mean if we take this away? And what the the biggest thing that I think works is just talking to your people and just saying, Hey, like, what do you think about this benefit we have? Like, if we changed it to this, like, how would that feel? What, and just the more you can precede it with people and get their opinions and get their feedback and, and iterate on your approach. I think that one helps people get comfortable with the idea that eventually this might change. Yep. And two, you get really good ideas. People have really good ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is always the case, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, people actually, actually can think for themselves. Yeah, no, it's fascinating to see that. Do you have an example maybe of your previous roles where, you know, something similar to what you just uh, described, right? You change something in a company and, and you did really well or, or the company did really well in terms of managing that change. And maybe an example, you don't have to name any names, but where that didn't go so well, like in terms of some of the learnings that you might have. That's a good question. Yes, I definitely do. I I haven't had enough coffee this morning, though, to (laughs) immediately come up with these answers. This is a tough example to even share, but I've had to do a number of riffs in in my day. And I think just really being planful about how to communicate, how to take care of people, how to... And I haven't had to do them at the scale of Google. I think that's a very different story. It's much easier at a small startup because you can actually talk one-on-one with individuals and follow up with questions and be there and be caring. And, but I think that's one where those have gone really well because we've been really thoughtful about how to treat people, which helps on both sides, right? The people who are staying and the people who are leaving. And after It helps with the aftermath. I think like riffs are a a perfect example of how you can destroy your culture overnight if you don't put a lot of thought and plan into it. I think one of the biggest lessons I've had in my career is actually something that I've like, I've just, I've been talking quite a bit about is just like involving people early in your decisions. And earlier in my career, we just made a quick decision to like remove a process that was silly. Yeah. but didn't do enough socializing up front or enough communicating of why we're removing this. And I think that no matter whether people sit down and they think rationally about like, oh yeah, this does make sense. They're yeah. going to just get frustrated and anxious because it's change. And so with any sort of change, you need to be thoughtful about how who you talk to and how you roll it out. And I think that was an example of just like, us not taking the time to do that. And it, it didn't go well, even though it was this obvious thing that I had to change. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 I, have one, I have one example that I'd like to share because you, tri- you triggered me there is at my first company that I started, we didn't really communicate transparently. It was always like, the company's doing great. We're going to conquer the world and let's go. Until we did it, right? Then we had to lay off people and we took them by complete surprise. And I... By default, I'm a very open person. I like to share both my business and personal life, but also with my employees. And it completely wiped away their trust because all of a sudden they were ambushed. That's what it felt like. Because literally the week before we were like, we're going to grow and we're going to hire all these people, right? And I made a promise to myself, I, I will never, ever be again in this position. I left that company. I started my new company. And one of the key values was transparency. And we, every month we share, to this day, we share our financials, we share how we're doing financially, we share what's in the pipeline, but we also, sh- we, when people ask us like, hey, are we, are we going to go through layoffs, which three years ago when the tech market imploded was definitely one of the options that we had to go through in order to survive as a company. And we said yes, which caused fear, but at the same time also build on the trust. And when we did have to go through at the start of COVID, when we had to lay off 50% of our staff because we lost 70% of our business overnight, people comforted me Yeah. when I had to tell them that we didn't have a job anymore because they knew exactly why we had to go through what we had to do. And it was a testament. I will, I trust me, I will never want, I never want to be in that situation again, but it is something that it's so hard to like do well, but that's the promise I made to myself. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I think it's like tre- it, it, treating people like adults, right? If they yeah. have the information and they have that clarity, then they're going to be like, okay, like that's a hard decision. And that's, 
yeah, that's a, a big testament to your leadership. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about yeah the trends that you're seeing happening. Things are, are moving very quickly in your space. Amazon just announced everyone back to the office five days per week. Yeah. What is what's the philosophy at character? What do you what what do you what do you see happening in from your point of view? I, that, that's the biggest one is this that I'm watching with an eagle eye. It's so yeah. fascinating. And I think yeah. we still don't have all the information, right? Like we're still making the history here, but yeah. I'm watching with eager interest to see how this all plays out. Cause I, I don't see a return to office mandate working except like your top performers who don't want to return to the office, aren't going to return to the office. And what are you going to do? Like, are you yeah. going to let them go? Probably yeah. not. Yeah. And it's also the science is really clear on who should return to the office. So I would just be curious to see a company sort of hone in on like, let's do a mandated return to office for the people who are going to benefit most from this yeah. and who really want this, which is like the younger employees who pr probably even started their careers during COVID and they're yeah. like hungry for those in-person connections and the mentorship and all of that. So I, I just, I'd be really curious to see companies really lean into the areas where we know it's most important and, and not try these one size fits all return to office mandates. I have friends who are at, at Google and they're required to be in the office a few days and they can like badge in to use the restroom on the weekend. And that counts as like a badge in. And you're like, this is so silly. Like why? <laughs> Why is this? Let me get my days in. Let me get my days in. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, that's um, funny. Yeah. But I just, I, I don't know. When you look at Amazon's leadership principles, a, a lot of this just contradicts some of those. Where it's like the ownership mentality. I think their leadership principles are phenomenal. I just yeah. a return to office mandate doesn't. I, I, I'm curious to see how it works. And I'm also curious, there's a lot of people writing about whether it's just a way to, to weed people out because they need to get rid of some employees. So maybe, yeah. But to your point, right? Like many top performers will say, then this is not my company anymore because of, because of the lifestyle that hybrid or fully remote position offers. Yeah, we've taken a stance of, we think it's really important to have a, a fair amount of in-person time just as a fast growing yeah. startup. You. It's easier to just, yeah. I think it's very possible to build a fully remote company and do it really well. It just yeah. takes a little bit more work. Yeah. And so we, we have three days in the office that we ask people to be there. I'm actually fully remote, but I go up every other week and yeah. then I'm there for a couple of days, but it's great to be in person. It's really fun. Yeah. And so that's been working for us, but I think it's hard. It's hard to tell people to go into an office and yeah. to, to, to do it on certain days. And so that comes down to people team efforts in a lot of ways of like, how can we make it fun to be there? How can we make it an appealing place to work? How can we make it easy? Those kinds of questions. So we're, that's one of the work streams we're in the middle of trying to tackle. Are the three days for the same for everyone or you can decide yourself which three days you choose? Same for everyone. Yeah. Cause that's, otherwise you lose out on the benefits yeah. of it. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, I know two people, for example, that work at a company where it's fluid, it's like two days and then they choose the days when no one's in office because then they can work. Right. I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's the purpose of this policy. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, it's great. No lines for the cafeteria and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and to your point, right? Like people find their ways around around these stuff. Right. Yeah. We're all adults. Yeah. Like we yeah. all figure out what works for us. And yeah. It's like at the end of the day, if that is not working for your company, because you're not getting your work done, that's a super different conversation. So yeah. I, it, yeah, I don't know. You're six months in now at Carrot AI. Like what excites you? Like, what are some of the things that you're like, this is, this makes you want to get out of bed to, in, the, in the morning? Yeah. One is just our potential. I think we yeah. have an amazing team. We have an amazing opportunity ahead of us and the space is just wild. It's like so much new invention and new technology coming out all the time. So I am learning constantly, which is super motivating. Like yeah. my brain is, has never been this exhausted. Yeah. And then also I just, I love building from the ground up and we have a lot of building to do as a team and as a company. So that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Yeah. Cool. 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 Hey, and for you, being in the position, you've had a, had an amazing career. In terms of if you look back, right, what, what would you tell your younger selves in terms of at, at, advice, knowing where you are now? 
I think I've taken most of my moves on gut where I'm like, I just, just feels like the right thing to go do this next thing. And that, that was good. So I would tell myself, do that and don't be worried about it. Because yep. I think I spent a lot of time stressing about like, because I have a lot of friends and colleagues who had a plan when they're like, I'm going to do this. And then that's going to lead to this next yep. role. Yep. And then, and I, I didn't really have that. I had the like, the, the natural jungle gym mentality of like, I'm just going to go do this because it seems like a cool company and a cool opportunity. And I like the people and it's worked out really well for me. And so I think that it could be just a lot of luck. And so maybe, yeah. maybe I tell myself to just constantly be looking for opportunities to learn and take on new challenges. Yeah. And the other thing I would tell myself is to, and I've given this advice a lot, is to, to just have more confidence in myself and mm. to believe more in my abilities to do things that were a step ahead. Yeah. Because um, I think it took me a few years longer than it should have to feel that way. And do you feel confident right now? Like, is that something yeah. that still like comes sometimes like overwhelms you or, or do you feel like, Hey, I got this. I feel like, Hey, I got this. Okay. There's, awesome. there's definitely moments in all of our yeah. careers and days. I think we're like hanging over my head here, but no, I'm, I, yeah, I'm feeling pretty confident now. Yeah. It feels good. Yeah. I love it. It's something I learned, especially speaking to founders that I look up to is like, Oh my God, they've built these big businesses. And over time, I come to realize is that no matter how big, how successful or whatever it looks like, everyone's dealing with insecurities. Everyone's still frightened at night that things are going to go wrong, that they might lose everything, uh, that people are not going to like them, that it's not clear what they communicate. And it doesn't mean that things get easier, but it's good to sometimes put things in perspective. And you, at least my experience is that you get comfortable with the un uncomfortableness and that's the muscle that you've been trained. It's like, okay, I know I'm going to get through this. Totally. And it's, yeah, it's just knowing that there's tomorrow's a new day. We yeah. all have bad days. I've been working with my team recently, actually, about how people have so many opinions about people stuff yeah. and it can feel like you're failing every day because somebody's calling you and complaining about something. And my advice is like, you're always going to hear complaints and it's always going to be from the noisy people. And sometimes you'll get the thanks, but they don't come quite as often. And just to remember that like, you are doing a good job and it's tried to drown out the complaints because you can't make everybody happy. Yeah. That's, that's a losing proposition. Yeah, that is a losing proposition. That's a losing yeah. proposition. Annie, this was such a pleasure and I'm so grateful for you to take the time to speak to me today, knowing what's happening within your company, knowing how busy your schedule is. If people want to connect with you, is the best way to do that uh, via your LinkedIn? Yeah, that's a great way. Amazing. Yeah. Thank Any, you so much. This was really fun. Yeah, Thanks it was for your so, good. so good. No, of course. I feel honored. All right. Thank you so much, Annie. Thank you. Have a good one.